Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Welcome to our special edition of Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I'm Dan Hurst. Our guest today served as senior pastor of Stony Hill Baptist Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina for eight years and in a variety of church ministry positions, including minister to adults, youth minister, interim pastor, part-time janitor, that sort of thing. He served as the vice president for undergraduate studies and distance learning at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, where he initiated a program to offer a fully accredited BA to prison inmates. And he served as dean of the college at Southeastern. He has a PhD in theological studies and a PhD in philosophy, so don't argue with him. He has written enough books to start his own bookstore, and he now serves as president of New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and Level College. He and his wife, Tara, are the parents of two sets of twins. We'll have to find out about that. Tara holds a doctor of education degree from Southeast Seminary, uh, which is focused on the preparedness of pastors' wives. That's an interesting. That's an interesting study. So we're we're certainly in for an interesting conversation. Mark Clifton, please welcome Dr. Jamie Dew. Hey, I'm really glad you're at New Orleans. Um, like I said, we were there this summer uh, during the convention and after. We stayed about a week after. Had a great time with with you, your folks. Uh, they let us use your podcast studio, your radio studio, and just the environment on campus was really great. Um, had a great time, and everybody seemed really positive and, and upbeat. And how long have you been there now? I've been there four years, been here four years and uh, three or four months now. Yeah. So it's, June's my, it's hard to believe. It's, oh my goodness gracious, it goes so fast. I mean, we're we're looking at five years here in just a minute. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, Enough that, you know, a lot of stuff has happened, but it still feels brand new and just like yesterday. Well, and a lot has happened and all of it, frankly, all of it good. Uh, it's, it's just a great, when we were down there, you had rededicated or, or updated the student center, right? Um, yep, that's I right. Think, talk a little bit about that. What's, what's that like? And Yeah. So, you know, the, um, a, a campus broadly that needs, needed back four years ago, probably $120 million of deferred maintenance and renovations. And thankfully in four years, we're a quarter of the way through that, about 30 million in. Wow. And um, part of that's been in God's providence, some hurricanes and some insurance money and some things like that, but a lot of fundraising and a lot of generosity from the Lord and from uh, our friends of our school. Um, We had a gift my first year of a million dollars and we were able to spend it on whatever we wanted to for the for the mission we had. And uh, so we put it towards the renovation of the interior of the HSC at the time, the Hardin Student Center. About a year and a half later, that same donor came back and said, hey, here's another million. And once we hit that point and same same deal, you're able to, you know, designate this, use it however you want. Well, we knew we needed to finish out some renovations on the student center. And but hey, now we're talking two million dollars that this one person had given. And, and with that comes naming opportunities. And so I floated that to that donor and said, hey, you know, is, do you want your name on the building? And he was emphatic, no, I do not want, do you want your wife? No, your children? No, your dad? No. And okay, wanted to be completely anonymous. And um, we said, well, can we make a suggestion? And he said, absolutely. And uh, we slid... Fred Luter's name across the table. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and so the backstory is obviously I didn't know Fred coming in. I'd met him once before. Right. But, you know, I came to faith when I was 18 years old. And, you know, I'm listening to the big dogs on little cassette tapes. Yeah. I'm listening to Adrian Rogers. I'm yep. listening, you know, to uh, <laughs> Bill Stafford. I'm, I'm listening to this guy named Fred Luter, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and I can just remember as a young, young preacher listening to this guy thinking, holy moly, how does he do that? Mm-hmm. And so, um, do you know what this is like? You meet these people or you have these people that you idolize and then, you know, you might get to know them and they might not be exactly who you thought they were. Right. Well, fast forward 2019, I moved down here and, uh, look, now that I live in this city, it was just so obvious this man's reputation in this, for whatever it is in the SBC, that pales in comparison to what it is in this city. 
And he is, you know, we call him affectionately the pastor of New Orleans because he is revered, he is respected, he is loved. And he is as good of a dude as we all thought that he was. (laughs) And um, so, you know, if we've got the opportunity to name a building, here's a man who's done it, done it well. And we just really felt like it needed to, it needed to have Fred's name on it. So um, we slid that to that donor. He loved it. We slid it to our board of trustees. They affirmed it unanimously. And we were just thrilled and honored that we got to do that. And, you know, for the dedication, the Lord just providentially aligned all the stars and things felt like, I so you were there, but yeah. uh, for anybody that was there, you know, they, the, all these political officials from the state and mm-hmm. from the city started showing up. Yeah. Well, Mark, we didn't know they were coming. Yeah. And we didn't know that they wanted to speak. So like <laughs> last minute, five, 10 minutes before we start, we're having to scramble to rewrite the whole order of service to make room for these politicians to speak in honor of Fred. And uh, candidly, they added something that we could have never produced. We could have never done it. You know, in God's providence that they were there to show up, you know, they were able to say it wasn't it wasn't us standing there in that moment saying this is historic. The city of New Orleans showed up and said that said that. Wow. To our people. The state of Louisiana showed up and said that to our people. And wow. that just because indeed it was a historic moment. And uh, of course, you know, we named the in, uh, interior piece of the building after Elizabeth. And mm-hmm. uh, that has meant uh, obviously, I think, a lot to the looters. Uh, it's meant a lot to our students, especially our African American students. Sure, I think it's meant a lot to our faculty. And frankly, it means a lot to me. So you know, sure. to be in a position now that I can give a tip of the hat, so to speak, to folks that have had an impact on me at some point in my life, uh, that that's a fun thing to do. And what a great role model for for students at seminary to have someone like Fred who plants his life in a city yeah. and maintains a great quality of of character in that city. Yeah. Uh, what a great and talk about the city. I mean, New Orleans. Yeah. As a as a place to have a seminary, uh, why would a why would a young person or any age person want to come to New Orleans and go to go to seminary? What what's unique about New Orleans that could prepare them for ministry? Yeah, as Southern Baptist, you know, we've got we're very fortunate to have six really good ones. We really are, um, and I, I mean that when I say that because you know one of the things one of the circles I have to traffic in and run in is what's called the Association of Theological Schools, our theological accreditor. And there's at any given moment 200, 230 different um, divinity schools or seminaries that exist. And against the backdrop of those, man, let me tell you, Southern Baptist, the six of us, by God's grace and favor to us, it's going really, really well in the six compared to the the rest of the theological landscape. So we're fortunate to have that. But I do think, and I thought this, honestly, I thought this long before I was ever the, the president here. I can remember probably about three years before Dr. Kelly announced his retirement. I can remember one day at Southeastern, I was a faculty member and I was sitting there. I, I walked into the, the place where we all ate and I got my food and I sat down. Some faculty members were already sitting there eating and they were knee deep in a conversation. And I said, can I sit here, guys? And they said, yeah, sure. Come on, join the conversation. And I said, all right, what are we talking about? And they said, oh, we're talking about who's going to replace who and all these you know, entity openings that are coming up. You know, One day Patterson retires, one day Kelly retires, one day all these different schools retire. Who's going to be president? And it was a typical Southern Baptist conversation of people speculating with the big names that were going to be uh-huh. there. Certainly my name was not in the mix of all this, <laughs> you know? So we're sitting there and everybody's talking about who's going to go to Southwestern, who will end up at this school or that school or that entity. And the subject in New Orleans came up. And I remember one of them said, "Ooh, man, who would want to go to New Orleans? Uh-huh. And I, look, I was, a, I was a Southeastern seminary to the bone as anybody could ever be. And I remember when that faculty member said that, I stopped eating and I put my fork down and I said, are you kidding me? And he stopped and he looked at me like, what? And I said, are you serious, man? Think about what Southern Baptists care about right now. Southern ba- And I think we mean it. I don't think this is lip service. I think we as Southern Baptists really genuinely mean these things. We care about the nations. Where better to train to go to the nations than in the most international city, maybe in the world? Yep. Right? Think about how much we care about urban ministry. That city is 60% African-American, right? If you want to do that kind of thing, that's the place to do it. Think about racial reconciliation. Again, same reason. Think about church planting. I mean, my goodness gracious, you want to plant a church? And I just went on and on and on basically saying that New Orleans as a city is probably, while it's got its problems, and look, it's got its problems. And I'm not going to be bashful about that or shy away from it or apologize for it either for that matter. But be all those things as it may, I think we can do something here that you can't do anywhere else in the country. 
And so where better to do theological education and ministry preparation than in the city of New Orleans? And those faculty that day looked at me, they paused for a minute, and one of them looked at me and said, man, you ought to go be the president there. <laughs> and I, we all laughed, and we just kept eating our salads, I think is what we were that day. And um, I just thought, well, that you know, I didn't even give it a thought, to be honest with you. But fast forward, you know, all of a sudden, my name is in consideration for this job, and I— whew, I really, I had been on Aiken's cabinet for a long time and saw the bullseye on his back. Sure. I didn't want that, man. I really didn't want that. But there was this overwhelming sense, two things, that number one, um, if for some strange reason Southern Baptist called on me to, to try, then I owed it back to them to stand up and try, number one. And number two, it was that same intuition I'd said to the faculty, those faculty members that day, that that one's actually different. Yep. And I think that if there's ever a place and if there's ever a school that we need to redouble our efforts and, and, and do something there, it is New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and Level College. And so, man, for whatever strange reason the Lord called on me, and here we are, and I love getting to do it. And I, that, that intuition is proving out every single day, you know, and it is, I think it's the reason that folks are coming here now is because they recognize this is unique. There's a great spiritual climate on your campus, right? Talk to me about about what's going on spiritually there on the campus right now. Well, th- th- and I I agree, and I I'm grateful for this. Let me just again say, I, I do think that there's a, a spiritual hunger and vitality on our campus right now that that I've not. I mean, I've I've been in great places. I've been in great places when I and I've been shaped spiritually in deep ways at these other places I've been. So I'm not. This is not to say I've never experienced anything. But I don't know that I've ever been in a place that just consistently day in and day out are striving together as a community to love Jesus and be obedient to what he's called us to do quite like this. And this is just a unique place in that regard. And um, now we're very intentional about it. We, uh, we really lean into certain kinds of things here on our campus to reinforce the mission statement. NOBTS and Level College prepare servants to walk with Christ, proclaim His truth, fulfill His mission. That emphasizes those four principles of servanthood, devotion, proclamation, and mission. And we say around here all the time, if it if what we're doing doesn't do one of those things, then we're not going to do it. And we've really been disciplined to prune things that need to go. We've really been disciplined to cultivate and nurture and empower things that will allow those four types of things to take place. And I I think the Lord has honored that in our people and in our systems and in our programs. He's honored that. We emphasize very strongly community, spiritual life, specifically in chapel. I mean, chapel is one of these things where it's not required, but we, we're pushing hard on our faculty, on our staff, uh, and on our students, that there's nothing more important you're going to do today other than coming together and love Jesus and worship together. That's more important than any paper you're going to write. It's more important <laughs> than any, any meeting I'm going to have uh, or any sermon I'm going to preach. We have to come together and take that seriously because you know what it's like, man. You know, I mean, you go to a seminary and all of a sudden your walk with Jesus can die because yep. it, it morphs into an academic thing. Yep. And uh, we're just trying to be as intentional as we can to not do that and let that happen. And then we're also very intentional to, to put feet to faith and put rubber to the road. You know, we do uh, about five or six times a year formally, we do what's called serve days. So the two that are the most obvious when we do this are once in the fall, once in the spring, we'll have, a, we'll have morning class, we'll have chapel. And then after chapel, we have a bag lunch on the lawn. And as a school, we cancel classes. Yeah. And... We go out into the neighborhoods and we prayer walk. We do door to door evangelism. We go into nursing homes. We clean the streets. We, we, we just engage our city and do ministry. And uh, we, we, you know, again, we push our people. We had 200 people this last time do that. Our goal for the next one is 400 people that we want to be able to mobilize into our city to do those things uh, because we just want to, we want to really try to translate all of this stuff that we're learning into real action and real obedience. And I, look, I'm not the only one pushing that. My, I ask my cabinet and I ask my faculty to catch that vision with us and help us lead in that and push for that and praise the Lord. They are doing exactly that. So I, I get to be the face of it, but I just got this big army of people that are pushing on that. 
And man, that is a, that's an incredibly fun and exciting place to be and deeply encouraging before the Lord. We haven't arrived to be who we want to be, but um, we know what it is that we're striving for. And, you know, uh, that's so encouraging on many levels. First of all, if you're considering seminary at any any place, uh, man, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at New Orleans and all of the other campuses they have and their online programs, just for the reason that, that we just heard. But also the fact that, right, all, all of our seminaries are, are really healthy and doing well. Yeah. Uh, and man, that's your cooperative program, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we're all part of that and that's we right. can celebrate it. So let me switch gears just briefly. We won't go much okay. longer here, but it just, you know, there are challenges in the SBC, and, and if we don't talk about those, people will think we're ignoring them. Um, what, what are some of the, the challenges that, from your standpoint as, a, as an agency head, mm-hmm. uh, what are some of the challenges, real briefly, you see for, for the Southern Baptist Convention in, in the decade yet to come? Yeah. Uh, wow. Their name is Legion. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I take great comfort knowing that the Lord is on his throne and the kingdom's coming you know, one way or the other, come what may, he's coming. Um, you know, part of it is, I think now, and this is unique in the last year and a half, I think that there are some, I think there's some global challenges that mm. have, will change our realities. And we've got to pay attention to that. There's political and national realities. And I'm not even talking about the SBC yet. I'm just talking about the United States. I think all these things, you know, they hit our people in certain ways. We've got to watch that. I think on those two fronts, we really don't yet know exactly how those problems will manifest it, themselves. Obviously, then in the SBC, um, what concerns me in particular is the number of dividing points that there are, not just that there are some dividing points. I mean, really, is I, I've not been a Southern Baptist as long as a lot of people have, uh, but my entire Christian faith, 28 years I've been a Southern Baptist, and in my short time, we've always had points we fought over. There have always been the controversies, things that could have divided us. What concerns me right now is that there's so many of them, and and each issue that we would divide over splits us in different ways than, say, that issue over there. That's exacerbated by social media, that right. is a constant fuel to fire. Right. And, and, and I think those are real problems. I'm deeply concerned about our spiritual condition right now Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, we take our cues of interacting with each other and um, commenting on each other and critiquing each other. You know, candidly, it looks almost identical in the SBC to what you see in American politics. And Mm -hmm. that is a that is a terrible, terrible reality that I have deep concern about. Um, So I have I have a lot of concerns over those types of things today. and those get so my- let's switch gears. Uh, those are yeah. all legit, man. We all feel them, and uh, you're right. I mean, social media just it just pours fuel on that fire constantly. Mm-hmm. But well, there are plenty of reasons to be hopeful, right? I mean, you right. see students every day that come and make tremendous sacrifices to serve Southern Baptist churches. So yeah, let's talk to me about why we should be hopeful in the midst of all of yeah. this. Well, by contrast to what I was just saying. You know, I like to point out to folks that one of the privileges of my job is that I get to see a really large sample size of the SBC, and it's a diverse sample size. I get to preach in the bigger churches, and I get to preach in the little churches, and it's about 50-50 on which is which when I'm out there preaching. I get to preach in the young, hip, cool churches and the old school, you know, country churches and rural churches and the First Baptists and all those types Mm -hmm. of things. And I get to be with associational missionaries, and I get to be with state convention leaders, I get to be with other entities, entity heads. What's encouraging to me is that as I get to do all of those things, which is daily for me, I think I get to see, because of my job, I get to see the SBC in a truer, better picture of itself. And I like to point out to people that there's really two different ways you can look at the SBC. One of them, one of it is to look through the lens of social media, and that's like staring into a black hole. You know, it's just, Ooh, that's bad. (laughs) Or you can look at the SBC through the actual people in real time. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of Southern Baptists get to interact with as wide of a swath of people as in the Southern Baptist Convention that I do because of my job, but I do get to do that. And I'm telling you, Southern Baptists encourage me. Yes. You know, the vast, overwhelming majority of them. I tell people all the time, listen, there's things in the me. I was just back in North Carolina visiting family last week, and one of my uncles said to me, 
Jamie, what's going on with Southern mm-hmm. Baptist? And yeah. I just looked at him and I said, let me tell you something. Don't, despite what you see on social media, at the end of the day, Southern Baptists are kind. Yep. They're humble. Yes. They're hardworking. Yes. They're faithful. They love Jesus. They want to make him known. That's who we are. Yes. And dude, despite the headaches of those other things I mentioned that are concerning, that reality I just described about their kindness, their their humility, their faithfulness, man, I get up every single morning ready to go to serve them because that's encouraging. Yeah. And it gives me hope. It gives me, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I, I know who holds it. And I'm not trying to be cliche there. I know who holds it. And I know the people that he's put here around us. And um, that's all really refreshing and encouraging and gives me tremendous amount of hope for tomorrow. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I Like you, I get the privilege to speak in all kinds of churches and state conventions. And just this past season, I've been in five or six local associations at their annual meetings. Mm. That's where you see real Southern Baptist people. And yep. they love the Bible. They love Jesus. They love the world. They love missions. None of that's changed. You know, they're not <laughs> running right. away from any of that. That's right. And uh, and God has a people and he has that's a remnant. Right. And, right. and uh, we ought to be grateful for that. Hey, that's you've right. got two sets of twins, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. What, what are their ages and their names? They're 16 and 13. And uh, the 16 year olds are Natalie and Nathan. Natalie's one minute older than Nathan. Okay. And, uh, you know, they're, they're driving now and all that. They don't have license yet. There's all permit <laughs> stuff. So this is me in the passenger seat clutching for dear life in New Orleans. Um, but they're great kids, man. They, they're they great, great kids. My, um, my oldest son, Nathan, has said since he was like two and could say things like this, he has said since then he wants to be a pastor. And that has not wavered or changed. It only seems to strengthen and intensify with every day. And uh, so, uh, and I could see him doing it, to be honest with you. Yep, I could see him doing it. Uh, (laughs) He's a very tender heart and soul and a good leader. So I think God's got some cool things there. Natalie, my oldest daughter, is she is very intelligent, uh, incredibly gifted, especially academically, and uh, a voracious reader. She wants to study English, not quite sure what she wants to do with a career, but they're great kids. Then I got the Sams and Samuel and Samantha. And once again, Samantha is a minute older than Samuel, and uh, they are just as funny as they can possibly be. And they're our hams, I would say. They're the okay. they're the ones that are, you know, going to be in the play and have mm-hmm. the lead roles and stuff like that, and and just intensely funny. All four of them play piano and other musical instruments, and they're gifted and they're good. Wow! At it. And so and Tara and I have always said there's two types of people in the world. There's those who play piano. Those who wish they play piano, and uh, Tara and I wish we play piano. So we said to them when they were little, like, "You're gonna play piano." Oh, that's and, awesome! Uh, they never push back on it, and they they played, and they're they're really good at it. I wish we had a whole lot more time to talk, but I, a couple more things I want to bring up. First of all, family, obviously, with two sets of twins and being in ministry, how would you encourage pastors to model good family life for their church? Mm-hmm. How, how would you encourage them to do that? Yeah, um, you know, we invest in your children and your wife more fundamentally than anybody else. You know, before you're the pastor of that church, you're the pastor of your family. And and that's true for all, all of us, right? All the fellows out there, you're the pastor of your home. And to that, to the the guy out there that's the actual pastor of the church, boy, it is essential that you invest there first and significantly. You know, I'm an apologist. So I, I do all the academic stuff and I spent my life in apologetics, and and as such, I've done tons and tons of talks in churches and high schoolers and college, all on the premise that the reason most kids leave their faith when they get to college is because they in, in, encounter some atheist professor in college. I don't think that's actually what's going on. I mean, I think that's a factor, but I don't think that's what's going on. Actually, research is starting to show us that the reason people abandon their faith is because they didn't have a proper home life. And the reason of those who actually stay and persevere in their faith, it's because their home life was what it was supposed to be. You know, they did things like have a meal, have dinner together as a family five out of seven nights a week. They had one spiritual experience in their home. Man, the bar is low here, guys. That's a prayer. That's right. that's a Bible story. That's something. Right. They serve with their parents. They're entrusted with some kind of ministry, you know, that not just they're doing it with their parents, they're actually entrusted to do it. And then they have some kind of mentor other than mom and dad. It's variables like that that cause people to actually hang on and persist in, in, their, in their walk with Christ when they leave their home. And so, pastor, 
those things have to be happening, you know? Right. And, and, um, so I, I would just encourage you're, you're their pastor first, you're their dad and husband first and, and invest there. You'll never regret that. Hey, real quick on MDivs. I'm, I'm, I, I got an MDiv from mm-hmm. Midwestern yep. uh, back when FDR was president. Uh, not quite that long ago, but <laughs> but uh, but I, I got my MDiv from Midwestern. Uh, back then, that was it, man. You went and got an MDiv. But yeah. today, talk to me about what the what the landscape looks like with theological degrees at 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 our seminaries, particularly at your seminary. Yeah. What, what's that look like, and how has that changed, or is it changing? Yeah, it's it's changed significantly actually. And there's so many different variables that go into this. It's kind of one of those things where it's it's frankly it's impossible to know exactly which of the variables is the ultimate cause of it. Um and I don't know that I, maybe it comes back. We'll see. But in short, it, I'd say, you know, if you rewind 25 years ago and before, I mean the MDiv was the vast majority of what would happen at any any of our schools. And the MDiv is still a major player in our schools in terms of what students select, but increasingly more. The shifts I think we're seeing, uh, a couple shifts. Number one, a lot of students are choosing not to do a master's at all. They might, they might therefore do an undergraduate in this, which I think means institutions like ours are going to have to lean a little bit more on the undergraduate preparation than we have before. And we're all really starting to do that now. Uh, second of all, when they do do a master's, typically they will want to do an MA instead of an MDiv. We still, just so our listener knows, we still push and promote unashamedly the MDiv because we still do think it is the Cadillac. It's the best. It's going to give you the broadest set of tools to work with. And I tell students, drill your cisterns deep. You're going to draw on them the rest of your life. And so don't shortchange that. The other big cause of this, though, that I think actually is a is a factor pushing people into the MA versus the MDivs because they're, you know, they're so much shorter. They're, you know, maybe two thirds the length of, a, of an MDiv, sometimes half. Mm-hmm. A big factor that's causing that, though, is the big shift from distant, I mean, from, from residential to distance. Right. And uh, with that move from residential to distance comes with also a shift from full time to part time. Right. Almost 95% of the time, a distance student is going to take part time load. And a, and a residential student about 95% of the time is going to take full-time load. And so why is that significant? Because of completion rates. So in short, a student that is a full-time student has about a 76% likelihood of finishing their degree program. And a student that's part-time has about a 23% mm. likelihood of finishing their degree program. So if you're in that situation where school is taking you forever because you're taking it part-time because you're distance. Well, then, yeah, you're going to opt for the shorter degree so that you can actually finish it. And that's a factor. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of factors that all of, all our institutions have to navigate yeah. with the future. But uh, I just come on to hear your your view on that. All right. Here's the deal. We end these with the final four, four okay. last questions. Yep. If you if you answer them correctly, we have a wonderful parting gift that we'll send your way. All right. So um, now you, you're a North Carolina guy. Yep. Now you're in New Orleans. So I got to ask you, do you prefer North Carolina barbecue or crawfish etouffee. Ooh. Wow. I thought you were going to say North Carolina barbecue versus like some other kind of barbecue. Nope. Man, you spun that one. Um, I think I'd take, take my crawfish. All right. I love North Carolina barbecue, yeah. but I'll take crawfish. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, what was the first concert you ever went to in person by yourself? Not with your parents. What was, do you remember what it was? Uh, I went with my sister to a New Kids on the Block concert. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't publish this. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. Was your first vehicle a truck or a car? It was a car. What was it? It was a Plymouth Turismo, a 1987 Ooh. Plymouth Turismo. Oh, what, it had like, like 80 horsepower or something? It had, it had a 2.2 liter engine. Yeah. I got a speeding ticket about nine days after I got my license trying to run from a highway patrolman. <laughs> Don't ever do that, by the way. <laughs> and then the last question, uh, you're on a desert island. You can only listen to one kind of music for the rest of your life. The only two choices you have are bluegrass or southern gospel. Ooh, bluegrass. 
Oh, me too. That's the yeah, right answer, yeah, actually. Yeah. That's the only answer. So <laughs> uh, as our team travels across North America, we stay in a lot of the mid-range motels. And so we collect uh, motel soap uh, that we don't uh, use. So we'll, yeah. we'll send that your way. Thank you. That's so you, kind you, of you. You, yeah. uh, you, you answered the four questions correctly. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for the way you love students, love the gospel, love the church and love that seminary. And we are delighted that you're there. And thank you for spending some time with us today. It means a lot to us. I appreciate you having me, man. Appreciate what All you right. guys are doing too. If I can ever do anything for you, let me know. Uh, okay. I, I, I wrote that down right now. So <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll think of something. All right. <laughs> Take care. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board, where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.